Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors. Today, we have Jared Vidalis with Highest Cash Offer, and he's going to be sharing how he is earning $250,000 a month on just $25,000 in spend. If this is your first time tuning in, I'm Steve Trang, broker, owner of Stunning Homes Realty, founder of the Offer Fast Homes app, the only app you need for wholesaling, and I'm on a mission to create 100 millionaires. So please message me, reach out to me if you need any help at all with your business. If you're excited for today's show, please give me a wave, give me a thumbs up. And as a friendly reminder, I don't charge a dime for this show. I don't make any money doing this. So here's all I ask. If you get any value out of this show, please tell a friend. Uh, you can share this episode right now, tag a friend below, or tell your best takeaway from the show later on. That way we can all grow together. Don't forget this is a live show. So please post your questions and Jared will be very happy to answer them. You ready? I'm ready. All right. So what got you into real estate? Okay, so I'm gonna give you the short compressed version, right? Okay. Just like just like everybody, you know, just for, I worked corporate forever. Um, I'm sorry, not forever, for a couple years. Yeah. And just like everybody else, I wanted something greater because I just had a different, I just have a different vision for myself. Uh -huh. um, but long story short, you know, I bought two houses, um, West Phoenix, um, had no clue what I was doing, got, uh, got jacked up in every direction you could. Um, thank God the, um, the real estate market was appreciating so fast. I didn't mm. lose, but yeah. what got me into my particular niche of real estate was the wholesaler who sold me, um, those two properties ripped, you know, 15 grand on both and a matter of 10 days. And I ripped, you know, 20 grand, 25 grand a pop uh -huh. over a period of eight months, stress, dealing with contractors and doing that whole thing. So right. I thought so on the flipping side, on the flipping side only, I started yeah. flipping houses, turned out I was not. I, I hated construction, wasn't my thing. Yeah. You know, you're adult, you're, um, you know, you're babysitting just adult children at mm -hmm. the end of the day. Um, yeah. So, you know, I thought, you know, if this guy could do it, his sales cycle is super, super short. Mind you, I didn't come from sales, marketing, anything at all. I was actually um, got my degree in engineering. Mm -hmm. um, you and I have that problem. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, you know, if this guy could do it, I could do it. So um, partnered up with Danielle, who I think was on a show a couple um, couple months ago. Mm -hmm. um, Jesse, Hillary, um, all awesome people to, to uh, put together this direct to homeowner acquisition strategy um, to bring the the concept was to bring flips into the company so we could flip them at extremely high margins. Okay, so you want to be direct to seller so you can flip for just pad the margins. Exactly. Okay. You know my. My, um, the sexy part in my mind was ripping those $100,000 flip checks, mm -hmm. right? And the only way to do that was going off market. Yeah. The market was compressing and um, the opportunity wasn't there like it used to be. Um, so, you and know. what year was this approximately? 2015. Okay. But mind you, I didn't, I hadn't experienced this, the sexy time, mm -hmm. you know, in the Arizona market. So, right. um, got in late 2015 and um, all direct to homeowner stuff. Um, started with wholesaling nationwide, did about 145 deals in 2015, every metro in the US. It was it was a shit show. Yeah. <laughs> All <Wow>. with um, <laughs> cell phone, DocuSign, and a computer, never met the buyers, never met the sellers. It was 100% virtual. Wow. Um, decided. Well, and I think to put in the context though, right? I mean, we're talking 250,000 a month. You started in 2015, that's only three years ago. Exactly. It's not that long. Not that long. Right? So, I mean, not trying to put it down in any way, but it only takes three years to get here with hard work. Exactly. So anyway, go ahead. Continue. Yeah. A little, little bit obsessive as, as people know, like yeah. my, my brain is always going in, in different directions, but mm -hmm. try to hone it in and, and stay focused. Right. Um, so did that in 2015 and slowly realized like you can't build a consistent model or operations on the back end for that matter with every market in the US. So, um, you know, we shrunk down to 15 markets, mm -hmm. you know, the top metros and some secondary markets in the US and then shrunk down to what we are today, which is just focus on uh, Phoenix, Vegas, Houston, and we'll do a little bit of stuff in California. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how I got started. Awesome. So um, going from just, you, so you just straight went from flipping to wholesaling. Tell me about your very first wholesale deal. Very first wholesale deal. Okay, so <clears throat> um, <laughs> it's actually a, a, a pretty cool one. So. Um, is actually when Dan, uh, Danielle and Jesse and myself were partners. Mm -hmm. um, Jesse, you guys know, found a property on hubzoo.com uh -huh. um, on Lafayette Boulevard in Arcadia proper. Um, so we picked this thing up from US Bank for eight, 820 or 860. Um, took it down all in. We're in at like eight, I don't know, 880 roughly. 880,000. 
880,000 first deal. So I had like, go big or go home, go big or go home. Right. So (laughs) (laughs) as a group, we took this thing down. Um, I had no clue what I was doing. You know, Danny saw this thing and was like, this is a great deal. Let's buy it. I'm like, sure, let's do it. Right. Um, took it, took it down, leveraged it. And I remember we held it for about two months until we found a buyer for it. And, uh, every month I had like, I had like 30 grand in my bank account and it's like, okay, Jared, your turn, your turn for the $10,000 hard money payment. And I'm like, oh shit. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, this is real estate. (laughs) Um, so like we eventually are, um, I found a buyer, Remax commercial broker found a buyer actually, and we Mm -hmm. um, wholesaled it for 1.175. So it worked out. So it worked out. So we made about 266 grand um, on our first wholesale deal. Three ways? Uh, five ways, actually. Five ways? Yeah. Okay. So that's pretty good. It wasn't too painful. It wasn't except too painful. For, except for the $10,000 payments. Yes. That was okay. that was pretty painful. <laughs> <laughs> Closed on New Year's Eve, so we all got to cash our checks New Year's Eve, which is Okay. Cool. So then what were some of your early struggles? Um, some of my early struggles was, you know, I, I don't think I realized that what we do today in um, direct homeowner acquisitions, mm-hmm. it's it's not it's not really real estate. Really, what it is, it's sales and marketing. Yeah. Um, and back then, I didn't realize that. Mm-hmm. So I was just really focusing on the assets, not really focusing on the psychology of the seller, understanding what their issues are, and trying to deliver as much value as I could to make it compelling enough for them to work with us yeah. um, as as a buyer. So, um, and at the end of the day, the you know, it, this is all a contact sport. The more touches you make, um, the greater chance of your conversion. So right. we, were, we weren't bringing enough leads in back then where we could really throw some serious numbers on the board. Mm-hmm. Um, it was maybe we went to like, you know, this is back in, you know, when we first, first started, like before, like all the nationwide stuff. We yeah. were doing bandit signs, we're handwriting letters and we're getting maybe you know, five phone calls a week and like, it's not working. You know, we, we, we didn't have the marketing down and we didn't have the sales process down. Yeah. So that's what really limited, um, you know, from us really gaining traction. Well, I think something hit on there too, right? It's a sales and marketing. And I think that's true of every business. Mm-hmm. Every business is a sales and marketing business. It's just whatever that other part you do is that second half. Exactly. The product or service is like, is secondary. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, um, we were talking about beforehand, uh, before we started here, about the velocity and why you like to wholesale versus flip. Can you talk about that? What makes wholesale so attractive to me, and I'm sure many of your other listeners are, you know, the, for us, our sales cycle from when a lead comes in to when we um, get it under contract is on average about 10 days. Wow, and that's then really good. Really good. And then on the back end, on the transaction side, it's about 22 days. Mm-hmm. So if you look at the entire sales sales cycle, say it's you know 32 days from when a lead comes in to when you have cash in the bank, 30. I mean, granted, you're leaving. I mean, in this market, you're not leaving too much on the table by mm-hmm. by, by monetizing the back end on the flip. But um, it's just so much quicker. Right. You have so much. You could bring working capital into your business a lot quicker, and um, it's just a lot less. Um, headache on on the flicks, fix and flip side, which we do, we do a lot of it, mm-hmm. um, but it's just a lot faster, right? And I think the the piece that you know it's like, man, we can squeeze out another thirty percent more, mm-hmm. but the resources we have to spend to squeeze out that thirty percent, then we just spent it back on the sales and marketing side that you guys are good at, exactly. So, um, what would you do differently if you were starting over today? If I were to start over today. Um, really, um, really probably spend a little bit more in marketing, Mm -hmm. bring that lead flow in, um, get, it's like going to the gym, right? You're going to talk to as many sellers as you can get reps in, you're going to get stronger, you're going to get more experienced and you're going to be able to convert a lot quicker or, um, a lot better, um, with that experience. So bringing the leads in and getting the sales, uh, the seller psychology and the sales process down. Yeah. So when you do spend, let's say when you're starting out five, 10 grand on marketing, you have the, uh, um, the capacity to convert and you're not wasting that money. Right. So get more no's faster, get more no's qu- faster, get your reps in, get rejected a lot, a lot quicker. Yeah. Like the thing we do for every new sales guy who comes into our company, mm-hmm. first thing we do, regardless of experience, we throw them on a dialer for two weeks straight. The really? most unmotivated uh, list you could think of before training before tra- throw them on. Well, there's, Man. there's like two days, there's like two days of scripting. Like this is what, yeah. this is the, um, this is the scripting process. Like uh-huh. you need to follow, go follow it. 
but you're gonna get your ass kicked in the in the bullpen. <laughs> the point is get their ass kicked um, right. sooner, have them get their reps in, have them fail a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. So you're practicing overcoming those objections like a lot easier on the crappy non-distress list. So when it's game time, mm -hmm. when that hundred dollar PPC lead comes in, it's not you're not practicing on that lead. Right. And a lot of that nervousness too. Exactly. Is out the window. Cool. I like that a lot. Um, what do you attribute your success to? Great question. <laughs> um, I don't want to sound corny, but a lot of success I, or a lot of, um, my success I attribute to is probably a lot of it's Danielle. She mm -hmm. came from the industry. She's been doing this for like nine years now. Yeah. Um, she has a ton of the experience, literally everything I know about the logistics of a transaction, how to structure, how to do everything comes from her. Yeah. Um, so that got me up really, 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 really fast. That, that cut my learning curve by a lot. Um, also, man, I, I guess it's just my, at the end of the day, I think it's just my personality, mm -hmm. you know, to, you know, I know what I want. I, I, I roughly know how to get there. Yeah. And I'm just, I just execute at the end of the day. Well, our friend Jesse shared with me that the reason why you're so darn successful is that you're a master of systems. And I think that goes that back to your engineering degree, right? Exactly. So, I mean, you were, you were an engineer for how long? I was an engineer for about two, two and a half years. Yeah. So you're able to leverage some of that technical know-how. Yeah. The technical know-how, like my brain works in, in sequences. Mm -hmm. So being able to sequence every process out, even including the sales process, yeah. so people think sales is so subject, um, subjective. How right. do you build a process around sales? But if you don't have a system, that is how it works. If you don't have a system, that's how it works. And you're not yeah. able to identify where, where the issue is. And if mm -hmm. you can't identify, you can't fix it. Right. So, um, a lot of, a lot of how my brain functions and then also just lost my thought. Yeah. Um, or we're talking about systems. Systems. Yeah. Anyway, okay. So <laughs> uh, obviously we have a lot of friends in town that wholesale, right? right. I mean, I, if we're not the most competitive market, I would like to know who is, mm -hmm. or who's more competitive than us. What? How is your operation different than all our friends? Like, um, kind of like what I've been touching on um, is I treat my operations like a true sales and marketing organization. Mm -hmm. um, we take, and um, also a lot of the systems and processes. Um, our sales guys, they only focus on sales. They focus on holding, um, building the rapport, uh, managing the seller communication, and mm -hmm. just as many touches and uh, moving as many balls forward every single day as possible. They're not even underwriting. We have a full-time analyst that underwrites all the assets. Yeah. So they're not thinking, so that, that was one of our issues in the past was our acquisition guys were underwriting, um, underwriting all the deals. And so when they're getting on the phone to uh, propose the offer, they went straight for the numbers. Mm -hmm. When obviously you gotta warm it up, you gotta go through the deal killers and do all that before presenting the offer because you wanna elevate the pain. So when you're coming in you know, with the offer, it's it's not that delta, that gap isn't in, in their mind that big. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to process, like segment all of our departments, our underwriting department, our sales, um, our sales team, transactions, everybody knows their part. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, we know exactly what return we get on the marketing. So everything, if you look at the organization as a whole, it's an, it's just one simple equation. Yeah. We know for every dollar spent, we get X amount of dollars out and everybody is measured um, that, that aligns with that exact strategy um, to make sure we, it all flows down and aggregates to that exact number that we expect to see out on our marketing. So, you know, what's funny is like, I think if you were to ask, um, you know, some the average person, like what, what does a, a, an investor, a cash investor do, right? Mm -hmm. You kind of have this image of this guy that's like sloppy, mm -hmm. right? He's coming to your house and he's just trying to lowball you and this and that, right? You don't think of it as a business. And that's the thing that I really love about what I saw with uh, with Keegley, mm -hmm. what I see you know, with Jamil and Josiah, what I see with Carlos and what you guys are doing. Like, you're running a business. You just happen to be in real estate. Exactly, exactly. So, so it's really fascinating to see, like you take a lot of the principles that make businesses successful. Mm -hmm. and just applied to wholesaling, which absolutely. has higher margins. Yeah, absolutely. Fast money, high ticket items, you know, it's it, it it's very lucrative. Yeah. So as far as sourcing deals, I mean, to get 250K, like where, where are top three, four sources? Top three to four sources. So as you know, we're owner direct on everything, like 99% mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah. Um, so our main, I guess, sourcing, marketing channels, kind of same thing. Um, telemarketing, we have a... Um, 
we have a call center down in Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, also, a lot of SEO, online stuff, PPC, um, RVM, like all the, you know, everybody's doing the same stuff at the end mm-hmm. of the day. Right. It's just like, for me, it's being able to have the sales process to uh, on the back end yeah. to monetize that. And also the, the, um, the lead management process as mm-hmm. well is super, super important. Because for us, um, you know, we're producing so many leads a day and yeah. being able to prioritize and process those leads, that that's the key, I think. Right. To strategize your follow-up. Exactly. The follow-up, how you process them, how you deliver the offer, how you talk to them, how you identify the person all the way down to the personality mm-hmm. type is what I think converts. The leads, everybody's getting the same exact leads. Everybody's cold calling. Everybody's doing online. Mm-hmm. You know, granted, some online guys have a competitive advantage and can know how to rank higher, but it's all the same stuff at the end of the day. Right. It's it's the operations and the sales process that that ultimately converts. So there's no particular list that you prefer over any other. To be honest, like my distress and my non-distress list convert exactly the same. Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So that's a very different answer than everyone else. Mm-hmm. So that's cool. Uh, what does your organization look like today? I mean, obviously, you, you, you mentioned earlier you got an analyst, you got some acquisition guys. Um, so, what are the different roles? How many people you have in each? Right. So, if you look at it from, like I just mentioned, departments. Mm-hmm. Um, in a sales department, we have, as of today, we have five um, full time acquisition guys. Um, we have one analyst. So, the acquisitions guys, what is their responsibilities? Acquisition guys' responsibilities are to, um, I mean, honestly, it's just, ma- it's like, managing relationships. Mm -hmm. So they have their pipeline, they're getting, you know, between 10 and 15 new leads every single day, Mm -hmm. staying on top of their new leads, managing their follow up bucket, prioritizing their follow up buckets, and then proposing and making offers. Wow, 10 to 15 a day is really good. Yeah. All right. Okay. So then you got the analyst. And then, um, oh, I guess um, over the top of that, we have our sales manager who Mm -hmm. manages all the sales guys. Okay. Because I mean, salespeople, I mean, they're all prima donnas. (laughs) They, it's like herding cats, right? (laughs) So like for me, for me to be stretched further and and really try to um, grow the organization, that was super critical. That took so much time off my plate. Um, So they, he manages, um, his main focus is growing the sales team in uh, both quantity and quality. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly recruiting, bringing new, um, bringing new sales guys on and then refining them, making sure that they're constantly growing, constantly learning um, what our specific niche um, kind of demands. Um, Then our analyst, Mm -hmm. she underwrites everything. So she's doing um, pre-contract analysis. So once a new lead comes in, Sales guy qualifies it, right? Mm-hmm. And then if it's if they figure that it's qualified, sends it to the analyst. She underwrites it based on what the um, seller note condition conveys. Mm-hmm. Puts like a kind of a ballpark, a target price and a max offer price. Sends it back to acquisitions. They're delivering those offers, and either we're in negotiation stages or they accepted or denied. Yeah. Um, you know, if there were negotiations, that's one more thing for them to follow up on. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how the that's how the analyst kind of you know, works with the acquisition team. Yeah. Then obviously we have our transactions um, girl, we have um, our bookkeepers, um, then we have myself, we have Danielle, and I think that's everything. You have that. a disposition person? Oh, and a disposition, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. And a dispositions guy full time. Okay, so, and just to clarify, because I know, I know there's different ways of, of, of doing business. Mm-hmm. You guys do everything over the phone. Everything, I wouldn't say 100%, but probably like 95% over the right. phone. But because we're in, you know, virtual markets as well. We have no choice but to be 100% on the phone in those places. Um, If we're in Phoenix, if like, for example, you know, a seller is old and and doesn't know how to use tech, or if somebody's on the fence and just needs that that in-person touch to close, because that's just how they communicate, we'll we'll go out to the appointment. But we we like to stay inside um, simply because we're able to make more offers. We're able to manage our CRM because we have so many leads. The pipeline's so big that yeah. you'll have, you know, 30 new texts a day from sellers and then you'll have missed calls, you'll have new web form coming in and you have to answer those live. We have so many variables that come in. It's almost mm. like our sales team is like a freaking high octane, just fueled on caffeine. Yeah. Like just, it's, it's, it's cool to see. Um, but yeah, we'd like to keep it all in house. That's incredible. So um, I know you can't really answer this question because you, you, you have your own call center service, mm-hmm. but like approximately how many full-time cold callers are working your, your stuff? We have, for our own campaigns, about 30. 30, wow, mm-hmm. okay. Um, and so, how do you pay those guys? We pay them by the hour. By the hour. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and they're in Mexico, you said, right? 
They're in Mexico. We pay them by the hour, by dialer time. Okay. We don't pay them for just sitting on the seat and, for and taking a lunch being break. Being in the right? building or whatever. Exactly. Okay. So it's all on dialer time, and then we pay them by the hour, and it, it works out pretty good. Okay. And then as far as acquisition, mm -hmm. how do you compensate the acquisition person? So acquisitions, so the way we um, onboard a new acquisition guy from, mm -hmm. from day one, they get a $2,500 um, draw base for the first three months, mm -hmm. plus 10% of the gross assignment income from all the deals that they produce. Um, aside from that, we have kickers and spiffs. Mm -hmm. um, because we have a large sales team and we, we love the internal competition, it's, yeah. it's, it's so much fun. Um, the person who gets the most amount of contracts for that week gets an extra two point kicker on top of those um, oh, that's awesome. of, of those contracts. Very right? cool. And, um, and then on top of that, uh, it seems like I'm giving away the farm, but it's, it's, it works out well. Um, each salesperson, their goal is a million bucks a year. Mm -hmm. So um, every quarter, if they hit their quarter million for the quarter, anything above that is an extra five point kicker on wow. top of that. Amazing. Uh, and then your analyst, how do you compensate the analyst? Um, she is um, pure, um, pure salary. Yeah, pure that salary. makes sense for that role. I just mm -hmm. wanted to make sure. And then the disposition. Person. So dispositions um, right now, um, we're and I, I got to convert him over, but um, he was in a tryout phase. We're mm -hmm. giving him no commission and then five points on the gross assignment income. Um, but when probably starting January 1st, if, if he's listening, um, <laughs> um, we're going to put him on uh, on a two and a half percent um, mm -hmm. uh, point or two and a half points on the gross assignment income just because like we're we're scaling our marketing. Mm -hmm. And obviously when you scale the marketing, the, the assignment revenue will grow proportionally. Mm -hmm. So like, if you think about it, if an acquisition guy's making 10, 10 points on a deal and a dispositions guy's making two and a half points, you need um, five acquisition guys to make the same amount as a, um, as a dis, or a, right. you know, roughly the same proportional yeah. amount. So yeah, two and a half, uh, two and a half points on the dispo side. Okay. And then uh, Colin Farrell, what's up Colin? Uh, he wants to know, Tips for building a massive virus list. Hmm. Well, I have this very proprietary. Now I'm not going to say. <laughs> um, okay, so tips for building. A, I'm a data guy, right? right? So the great thing about our product and service that that we deal with, everything's public record. Mm -hmm. um, go on CoreLogic or Adam Data and find your county, pull all LLCs, right? And then um, if you want to find the top guys, I don't know if this is too detailed, but if you want to find the top guys, take that sheet, say it's 50,000 buyers. Um, you can make a pivot table, sort it and see who's holding the most amount of assets mm -hmm. in, in that area. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, they're fix and flip. It could mean, you know, they bought back in 2009 and they're holding on hundred homes and they're not buying anymore. Right. So limit it to the last one year, buy a list and then take those LLCs, um, skip trace them, find the owners, pick up the phone, give them a call. Okay. And just to clarify for you guys, um, I would definitely not recommend learning how to pivot. I would go on a Fiverr and have them pivot <laughs> for you for five bucks. <laughs> All I do, I just, I'm just in Excel like m more than I'm doing anything right yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, I recently learned, you know, like the last 12 months how to pivot. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so yeah, call them on to ask it, lock them over the phone. So there we got that. And then, um, okay, so that's, that was all the questions. And guys, please do ask more questions. Um, so we were talking compensation. Who's in charge of the KPIs? I'm in charge of the KPIs. Okay. So you look at them daily, weekly? I look at them <clears throat> once a month. Once a month? So what we do is because we're so heavily um, reliant on converting the marketing spend, mm -hmm. our target is 15% uh, of the cost to the revenue. So if I'm spending, for example, um, you know, and I guess the podcast case, 25 grand, I gotta be making at a minimum, I think it's like 230 mm -hmm. on that. 15% um, of, the, of the cost of the revenue, that comes out to like 6.6 .6 times your yeah. marketing spend, right. gross. Yeah. So um, the, many of the, the things we look, I mean, do you want me to tell yeah, you like what definitely. I look at? Um, I think this is super, super important because the thing is, now that we're trying to scale, we're trying to go from 25, 30 a month mm -hmm. to um, about 85 grand um, come Q4 of next year a month, wow. right? So if you said, I'm gonna go from 25 to 85, I'm gonna say, holy shit, like that, mm -hmm. how the hell am I gonna lose money? Like it's very uncertain. Mm -hmm. But the thing that makes, that builds the confidence is, like I mentioned earlier, is building that equation. Mm -hmm. So we look at we look at everything from, I guess, starting in the upper left-hand corner, we're looking at, uh, volume of leads per month. Mm -hmm. 
how many of those are qualified, right? Because qualified or a volume of leads doesn't necessarily mean qualified right. leads. Yeah, it could be the white pages. Exactly. And then we run um, the cost per lead only based on the qualified leads mm -hmm. because some lead sources are less qualified than other lead sources. Right. So some people may think like, hey, PPC is ridiculously expensive, my cost per lead is 200 bucks, mm -hmm. but you don't know that your your qualified ratio is you know 60%. Mm -hmm. Some people may say telemarketing is amazing because I'm making a lead at 20, 25 bucks, right. but your qualified ratio might be 20%. So if you actually look at the cost of a true qualified lead, PPC, my, my PPC crushes it out of all yeah. my cheaper lead sources. Yeah. And it's also the highest grossing ROI. So being able to understand like where your most effective lead sources are relative to you know, the revenue, how much um, gross assignment income each channel is producing, and then we also break it out by market. Mm -hmm. So then we could also understand, hey, look, um, California is underperforming. Let's reallocate the marketing dollars to uh, Phoenix or Vegas, where we're you know 1.5 times the gross revenues. Yeah. Let's let's make those. We we're able to make those decisions a little bit more, yeah. and everything runs out to the very end, which is just ROI. And what a lot of people don't realize is they don't um, look at ROI relative to time. They're just looking at you know, 300% or 500%, but is that over a six month sales cycle or is that over a two month sales cycle in PPC case? Right. So running it relative to time to understand, hey, look, this is our highest performing marketing channels. Mm -hmm. Let's double down on our, on our, on our highest ones and, um, and, just, and just go from that strategy. I mean, that's a whole nother level, right? And I think that's kind of like, I think uh, scaling up uh, was that, you know, right. how fast the money comes back. Exactly. Cause it's not just what the return on investment is. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's how fast that money comes back in as well. So very, very interesting point. I think you're going to have to like, you could probably sell like an MBA if you could <laughs> explain all that to somebody. I am not a finance guy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's crazy, right? Like, but this is what it takes to be this successful. Uh, what, so you're, or you were talking about your Houston, Vegas and here, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so we talked about the monthly marketing, 25K. So what is your monthly overhead? Like what does it cost for you to stay in business? Between 25 and 30 grand a month. And on that, top of the marketing? On top of the marketing. Okay. So that includes um, building lease, includes um, base salaries for the support staff, mm -hmm. um, all the toilet paper, freaking <laughs> coffee that these guys yeah. drink, energy drink, like team outings, right. like everything, IT, new computers for sales guys, um, gas, the whole, the whole shebang. Very cool. Um, so Isaac Solis wants to know what does your day-to-day -day tasks consist of? And I imagine it's gotta be all over the place. Day-to-day <laughs> um, -day tasks, like we're still very heavy in the operations because mm -hmm. I wanna make sure the team right now is, is super, super strong. Mm -hmm. Because if there's, one, if there's one weak point in the equation, when we scale, that weak point is gonna come out and it could just be a, a freaking you know, missing link, right? Yeah. So making sure the team is super, super strong. I spend a lot of my time on continuous education, um, constantly refining my analysts to, to, to learn how to underwrite specific neighborhoods, different markets, whatever it is, returns. And the great thing about an analyst is if you, if the market shifts or anything ever happens or who knows, I have one point of failure where I say, hey, Kayla, you're underwriting San Francisco at 20 at 20% 20 rather than communicate to sales guys who don't hear anything anyways. And uh, hey, guys, we're commuting or we're underwriting at 20%. Like it's it's just it just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So I could train one person on all the numbers at any given time. I could pivot. I could shift whenever I need to because um, it's a lot easier. And um, so training, right? Mm -hmm. Training, refining the systems, refining the CRM. Man, uh, working on the lead sources to making sure the lead sources are producing and yeah. then managing the higher level KPIs to, and uh, to making sure that we're hitting numbers, we're staying on track and also um, training my sales manager on how to manage the sales team to making sure that they're hitting numbers and they're staying on track and they're growing our team and just quality and quantity. So you're coordinating or dealing with the sales manager? Yes. Okay, awesome. And Real, uh, Ray Delgado wants to know if you have $500 to spend one hundred dollars. Five hundred. Oh, <laughs> what would you spend it on for marketing? Um, probably gas to drive for dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gas and Great a cheeseburger. Answer. Um, I mean, honestly, like if I had, well, I mean, if you're in the Arizona market, I would probably just hop on monsoon. All those little red dots you see on monsoon that are pre foreclosures. Mm -hmm. um, go hop on there. Go find a skip tracing website. Call the homeowners. Yeah. Well, and I think you don't even have to have monsoon, right? You just go on Zolo. Or Zillow, correct. Yeah. Um, okay. So, are there any services that you offer? I know, like you know, 
one of the benefits of being successful in your industry is that you get to create systems that work for you mm -hmm. and then you can offer that to someone else as well. Is there any services that um, you have available? For right that? now, um, I'm so focused on the operations. I don't really have time to really offer any other services, but mm -hmm. something I am a co-partner in is a, um, a company called Call Geeks. Call mm -hmm. Geeks, they, um, it's the team in Mexico where we've trained these highly, highly trained, um, not VAs, but uh, pretty much just sales guys yeah. um, to make outbound calls and prospect. And that's what a majority, that's probably what 65% of our pipeline is, is mm -hmm. um, leads from um, our call center. So we offer, if you go to call, uh, thecallgeeks.com, um, that's where you could find more information about our telemarketing services. And then also um, we probably spend, half our marketing expense is, um, is pure data. Um, you know, I have an affiliate link with, um, with, a, with a skip tracing website probably 10 grand of my cost comes directly from skip tracing. Like yeah. no lie, it's ridiculously expensive. Right. But um, but in this day and age, you have to be proactive on getting in touch with that homeowner and that's how we do it. So right. if anybody wants any skip tracing, just reach out to me and um, I'll point you in the right direction. Cool. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I saw from some other people posting is like, this isn't work, right? This whole selling thing's a scam. You guys can't you know, I've talked to these homeowners. I can't, I can't get them to down or whatever. What would you say to them? Man, it's like I tell my sales guys, you know, if you're relying on one motivated seller mm -hmm. and that motivator, motivated seller doesn't work out, you're not eating for the month. You got to build yeah. <laughs> a, robo a robust For the pipeline. month, you're poor guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they get paid commission once a month. But yeah. <laughs> you got to build a robust pipeline. You can't be yeah. highly leveraged on like a couple maybes. Mm -hmm. Build it big. So if like one or two fall out, you have a couple more to fall back on and you have more yeah. op At the end of the day, you got to bring the opportunity into the door, right? right. It's twofold. You got to bring the opportunity into the door as far as marketing and you have to have the state sales competency to close mm -hmm. it on the back end. Yeah. If they're saying it doesn't work, either they're not bringing enough opportunity to the door or they don't have the sales competency to close it. Right. There it is. And maybe consistency. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Slight possibility. Uh, so Valencia uh, Cooler wants to know, uh, where are you pulling your lists from? Um, to be completely honest, um, I'm pulling lists straight from the county just because mm -hmm. it depends. So you have the county, we have list source, and mm -hmm. we have Adam data. Adam is spelled A T T O M. Um, they're, they're a subsidiary of uh, Realty Track. I think everybody knows who they are. Mm -hmm. um, so we're pulling, uh, we used to pull a lot from CoreLogic and uh, Adam data, but now it's more county because we're probably reaching out to probably over a million people every single month. And as you can imagine, that's a crap wow. load of data. Wow. And if I'm, that's the whole reason why, if I'm just targeting distress data, uh -huh. I'm blowing through that in like a day. So yeah. my only option is to pull entire counties and skip trace it. And if I'm pulling an entire entire county from, you know, a vendor, you know, it's like probably 20 grand. So mm -hmm. I'm going directly to the county, getting the CD for like 500 bucks and uh, just using that. Going to Maricopa County records and getting a CD. Maricopa County records. Any, what do they even offer? Um, it's everything. It's uh, you have your APN, your first name, your last name, mailing, property, asset class, um, wow. zoning, the whole shebang. Everything you need to sort it out, throw it into a batch skip tracing software mm. and get all the data you need. Incredible. Uh, okay. Um, we were talking about earlier, you know, there are some things that you do need help with your business. So uh, particularly, uh, particularly um, personnel, right? Yes. Uh, so what do you, what, uh, what do you need help with right now? So like I mentioned in 2019, we have a pretty aggressive um, growth strategy. I mean, almost so, quadruple, no big deal. <laughs> so, so right now we currently have five sales guys and we're spending yeah. that 25 to 30 grand a month. Um, by the end of 2019, we need to be at 11 sales guys and we're going to mm -hmm. be spending that 85 grand in marketing. Yeah. So if anybody out there um, have to be local here in Maricopa County who's looking for a sales position or more of an acquisition position, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I, I wanna interview you. We're yeah. looking for as many qualified sales guys as we can, the top 25% out there. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested at all, um, just reach out to me. I'd love to talk to you. Cool, so any, anything else besides sales associates or just sales associates? Um, uh, analysts. Um, our analysts is slowly, become, you know, at our capacity. Getting a little overwhelmed. Yeah, so more of like, um, you know, an intern or an assistant, somebody who has underwriting experience. Again, we underwrite in Phoenix, Vegas, Houston. Underwriting in markets other than Phoenix is not hard. We have MLS access everywhere. 
So um, it's the great thing about our market. That might be why we have so much competition. <laughs> every house, almost every house is the same. Exactly. There's the great, I mean, the thing about going in Houston, everything we bought has foundation issues. Yeah. You have a house from 1954 on the west side. I mean, the thing's pristine. Yeah. <laughs> but um, looking for um, analysts, underwriters, somebody who could assist our full-time analyst and, um, and, and help us out with more properties. You know, when I was trying to hire real estate agents back in the day, um, we found a lot of uh, people that with that kind of experience in the WP Carey School, people trying to get in real estate. So you might want to check that out. Idea. Um, okay, I, I had somebody reach out to me recently as well, asking me about coaching. You know, um, I told him like, you know, if I were to spend money today, I probably start with I probably start with Rafael Vargas. Yeah. But what would you say if someone was looking to get coaching? Uh, depends on what type of coach you have. Yeah. Like your 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 business and like systems coach that. Mm-hmm you know, they're developing the blueprint with you and helping you execute and holding you accountable. Mm -hmm. You have um, sales coaching, you know, for that, I recommend John Martinez. He's been freaking awesome. Yeah. Um, Also, um, Jack Daly. Mm -hmm. Jack Daly's a freaking beast. That guy's built like six organizations of 2,500 sales guys and sold them all off. Wow. Um, So if you want, if you want sales management and sales training and and how to develop an awesome culture and, and keep everybody in line and aligned and accountable, Jack Daly, John Martinez are the best. Um, on the like business blueprint side, Raphael, and I know uh, Carlos and Sal were on here, they're really, really great mm-hmm. as well. Um, I would just see which personality you fit with best and um, go with one of those guys. Yeah, cool, that's awesome. Uh, so you mentioned earlier, uh, at the very beginning of the interview, you were talking about you got your follow through process, um, ranking, prioritizing who you're calling. Mm-hmm. So what CRM are you using to do all that? So just like, everybody in this niche of real estate, you know, we use Podio. Yeah. It's not exactly the smoothest CRM, um, works for now. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we have Podio um, built out, um, actually um, Sal Shakir helped us out, mm-hmm. um, pretty much retrofitted it to uh, to our exact sales process and, and business. Yeah. Um, so just out of Podio. Yeah. And we have a bunch of other ancillary tech that kind of talks to it as well. well as uh, Carlos posted last night, Sal broke or hit, hit their limit. Oh yeah, Rodeo. sent me a picture a couple of days ago. <laughs> five, five million flows, uh, Global yeah. Flow shut him down for the month. Yeah, he found the limit. If they say unlimited, he found the limit. <laughs> uh, so Gustavo says Diego wants to know, how do you deduct taxes from the money you pay in your, col- your call center? How do we deduct the taxes? Is it considered marketing or employees? I would say it's marketing. What would you consider that? I just consider it marketing. Yeah. What I, I look at, I don't, I, I, I try to tie everything to a specific marketing campaign. Yeah. So for, you know, I have I have a cold calling, um, SMS, PPC, RVM. Mm-hmm. I tie all the cost of labor, e- any VAs that assist with the campaign uh, lists and skip tracing, all total it up to that one campaign. So in this case, um, the VAs, they all their labor goes under the telemarketing campaign cost. Yeah. But taxes, I don't think we pay taxes. Yeah, good. It's a good system. I mean, not. I mean, not like IRS tax. <laughs> we don't. We, we we don't pay Mexican taxes. All right, IRS, ignore that last comment. Uh, and you know Ron Ronner, right? Of course. Yeah. So he says, uh, you know, he wants to say hi from Houston. What's up, uh, Haley? Have you ever thought about using a call center to help answer calls and set appointments for yourself? So an inbound call center. Do you have anything like that? Um, the thing is, we don't really go on appointments. Mm-hmm. So if we if we hired, and actually it'd be really, really effective. Mm-hmm. Um, what we do is qualify the lead and then they push it over to our CRM and our sales guy that then makes a, uh, the determination if that's qualified or not qualified. Mm-hmm. We don't wanna leave that determination up to um, the VA necessarily. Yeah. So um, all inbound, um, all comes into our sales floor. So mm-hmm. our inbound from um, our website calls like any like super distressed campaigns, um, you know how people like will send an RVM and, and send it to voicemail. Mm-hmm. If it's like a pre foreclosure list, I just route that on a simultaneous call to our sales floor because they're mm-hmm. higher priority calls. Yeah. Um, but everything um, is aside from the telemarketers who are who are doing the prospecting and they get the callbacks. Those all go back to the um, back to the center. But yeah. anything that's inbound, that's already a qualified lead, comes into our sales floor. And I guess that round, round robin or like whoever's closest to the phone? Um, simultaneous call. So everybody's oh, phones okay. ring at one time. First one to pick up gets the lead. Uh, whoever's hungrier. Whoever's hungrier. Awesome. I love that. Uh, okay. Are there any other tools or systems that you can live without? Hmm. Tool systems. I mean, besides the ones we kind of built ourselves, like probably like a call rail mm-hmm. um, or dialer. Yeah. 
What do you use for a dialer? So right now we use um, X5 Whitetail mm -hmm. yeah. product. Um, it's it's pretty good, um, but we're thinking about transitioning over to a d new dialer. Mm -hmm. um, that's what our that's what our um, our tel uh, our center uses. But I'm thinking about and this is like pure testing phase, putting our entire team on a dialer. Mm -hmm. um, so they're they're all connected and um, and have live inbound transfers from our um, call center over yeah. to our sales team. Because the thing we thing we found out was a lead that comes in from the, the center, there's like a 50% chance that we're actually gonna, they're gonna pick up the phone and we're gonna continue the conversation. Right, that's so the th hardest part of exactly. a handoff. Exactly, so being able to shorten that or close that gap rather, and just have it um, have like, and there, there has to be a certain amount of check boxes I think they would have to check off before transferring. Like, mm -hmm. do they wanna sell within 30 days and is there any uh, points of motivation? And if there is, transfer them over regardless of price. So yeah. we continue the conversation and either choose to tie it up right there or put it in a more high priority, get it to underwriting and get it back so we could deliver an offer. Cool, awesome. Uh, what would you do if the market slowed down or took a dip? So, the great thing about our model is we make money in an up market, we make money in a down market. Yeah. So um, from a more of a like a holdings perspective, um, right now we're kind of, we're putting the balls in motion on how to structure um, certain types of funds so we could um, so if that when that time ever does happen, we're using this we're using this period between whenever whenever that is. I mm -hmm. have no clue when that's going to happen. Right. By the way. But um, we're we're. Getting, we're building rapport with private money guys. Mm -hmm. That's why we're flipping. We're um, we're showing that we're getting them a track record, showing them that we're reliable. We do what we say we're going to do. So when the time comes, we're easy to pull those funds in mm -hmm. for a lar larger aggregate pool. So we could then go buy those assets strictly on a cap perspective. Yeah. Oh, that makes that sounds like you're ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is your why? What is my why? You know, I was I always think about this and like. So my why is so the thing when I when I was growing up was mm -hmm. I'm like a super convenience guy. Like I'm about I'm the guy who would sell my house to a wholesaler because it's quick and easy. <laughs> yeah. Um so like saying that like like turn like worrying about stuff like turning off lights and like uh not like going someplace and not wanting to buy whatever I wanted on the menu. Mm -hmm. Like it sounds stupid but like I want to do whatever like I want to do at any given time. Right. Like, so being able to achieve that through, I guess, I, I guess through like money, I guess money, mm -hmm. money solves, solves a lot of problems, doesn't mm -hmm. solve all the problems, but, um, more it, than 90% of them and more than, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you say money doesn't buy happiness, you don't have any. So <laughs> I'm yeah. just kidding. Uh, boiler room. Um, yeah. well, I always like to think of was it, uh, who's that? Um, Danny, who's that? Um, he had a show. Uh, on, on on Comedy Central, but it's like you know, like you say, money can't buy happiness. But have you ever seen a guy on on a on a jet ski frowning? <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. No. <laughs> um, so just like just being comfortable, it's it's that peace of mind, yeah. knowing like everything's okay. I think is what it right. really is. So peace of mind, and it's not really financial freedom. It's really just freedom, like freedom. just complete, complete freedom. freedom. Exactly. Awesome. I say that now. I say like I want to. I want to build this company and build this like cash flow business so yeah. I could go like not do anything but like and go like travel but like my personality I always think about it like I'm always it just it just goes right you can never retire never retire yeah I'll try <laughs> <laughs> uh what is your superpower my superpower probably honestly probably probably the systems and processes yeah side um being able to break down an issue and then systemize it um mm -hmm. in, the, in the most effective way and efficient way possible and um my biggest problem not superpower is probably delegating so i could build <laughs> i could build a system all day that's but, the challenge with people that are good at things <laughs> God, they can't I, delegate i i hate i i don't want to be the good i don't want to be the best at it yeah. um because like i'm like the freaking like if you look at the i, I forget what it's not Rich dad, it's like that um, quadrant of mm -hmm. like personality. The investor quadrant. Like I'm the I'm the I'm the S. Like I'm the freaking surgeon that could get down and like do it. Mm -hmm. I can't. I, I just gotta get away from that. All right. You know. So like I'm really good at building systems, but being able being able to have somebody manage that system and, and execute and complete it, um, that's kind of my weakness. Interesting. Um, what is your favorite, best, or most interesting failure? 
Man, curveballs. Yeah. <laughs> um, most interesting failure. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe on you know when I was doing the flips and construction, maybe I realized that wasn't something like I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I think it's like I don't have like any like big failures or a bunch of like little micro failures mm-hmm. um, that happen like almost every single day. So like every right. single day I'm learning. Yeah, I don't have like you know I you know, crashed my car when I was drunk and now I don't drink and drive anymore. It's mm-hmm. like, <laughs> I, I, I try to make the best decisions I can. And like, as things come up, these little micro failures, I just, I just log in the back of my brain, just that will never happen again. And Justin's week as you go. Exactly. Okay. And then, uh, Chris Jackson mentioned that there's a smartphone.io that I don't know if you know, heard of that, but it's tied to podium and has a, has a multi-dialer. So just, uh, something he p- pointed out there. So, uh, what is the, you know, uh, ending the show, what is one thing that you want to leave with the listeners? Um, well, so if you're, I guess if you're just, you know, just getting started, and we were all there at one time, right? Yeah. Like the biggest thing was like, it's just, it's just understanding what you want. Cause in real estate, there's a thousand ways to skin the cat and make money. It's crazy in real estate. How, it's, how, how many different ways there are to make money in it? It's so it's so easy to get shiny object syndrome, and we all do it. And that's like <laughs> big my biggest growth. Like when I first started, like three or four years ago, was yeah. let's start a freaking direct mail center. Let's like do this. Let's do like and like we never focused, no, never aligned on one singular focus, one target, one number. Mm-hmm. And what I've done now is really trying to pull it all together. I mean, yeah, you get distractions, but you just got to like put your like horse blinders on mm-hmm. and just go. Um, so anybody just getting started, pick, I mean, yeah, figure out what you want to do, pick one thing and don't get distracted. Like envision, like the mentally vision what that looks like, because the thing is you have to paint the picture for yourself. If you don't right. paint the picture and you're not already living it, you don't know, you don't, you already don't, you don't know what it takes to get there. Mm-hmm. So figure out what that is, paint the picture, have like some compelling vision that's compelling enough for you to actually get out of your ass, like get off your ass and actually take action and take a little bit of risk yeah. and just go for it. That's amazing. Um, and you know, again, not to under sell what you've done, but you know, 250,000 a month, like it is only three years. Mm-hmm. If you put your head down, focus, know your vision and go after it. It is possible. You're living proof of it. And I think that's awesome. Exactly. All right. So guys, don't forget, we do have the monthly meetup tomorrow night, 4:30. Uh, Jamil's going to be talking about how Keegley works. He's basically giving a presentation on what Keegley does. Beast. It's unbelievable when he showed it to me. Honestly, I was a little intimidated. Are you going to record that? Because I'm not going to be here. So I'm not going to. Uh, yeah, I'm actually talking to Farai about recording it. So we'll awesome. see if that goes. See how it works. You know, it'll be the first time we've done it. Uh, but it's actually very intimidating what they're doing. It's like, I don't know if we can catch those guys. Yeah. Well, don't share it to anybody. <laughs> just give me the video. I don't want the competition. I'm just gonna use that competition. Um, and the next week is gonna be our last episode for the year. We got Max Maxwell flying in from Carolina, so that's gonna be an awesome show. So that's it. Thank you guys for watching, and thank you. This was incredible. Appreciate it. Thank you.